Greetings art lovers and welcome to another edition of the Sight and Insight podcast with me Judy Curtis and Lawin Connie Nagel and David P. Curtis. So I'm going to jump right in here with uh, my little bit because I've just come back from Truro, uh, Massachusetts, where I was visiting a group called 21 in Truro. Uh, and I thought it was uh, just an, an interesting experience. If you've never met this, uh, this group, I'm sure I hope you've heard of them. It's 21 uh, women artists who are uh, scattered in various parts of uh, New England, or even South Carolina, and actually Colorado. So they come from various places and they get together for one week of the year, usually in September, and stay at the Sladeville Cottages down in Truro. Uh, and there's a historical connection with uh, the Sladeville Cottages because that's where the artist Caleb Arnold Slade uh, set up his studio uh, and uh, and ran these cottages. So it's near Corn Hill where um, Edward Hopper was painting. <laughs> so there's a lot of history in that area um, of the artists who came and visited there. And oftentimes the artists from New York would come over to Provincetown nearby and they would paint there too. So they have um, a different slant on an art. It's not quite as traditional as the art upon Cape Ann that I'm used to. Nevertheless, it's, uh, they have some very interesting things. And the 21 in Truro are a group that all have a diverse way of um, presenting their work. They've uh, recently uh, added a sculptor, a uh, digital artist. So they're expanding their repertoire, that it's not just art, it's not just pastels, watercolours, oils, uh, but they're moving into different mediums. And as they say, they all get something from the camaraderie of the uh, of the week and they learn about different techniques that somebody else is doing and so it's a learning process as well as meeting up with old friends and, and just being able to... Um, be, as part of a group, I think it's empowering for women who sometimes feel that they uh, get the short end of the stick when it comes to having exhibitions or having their work appreciated for what it is and not because of their gender. Um, it put me in mind of the uh, the group, the Philadelphia Ten, who were active uh, oh, uh, back in the uh, early 20th century, which included uh, Teresa Bernstein and Emma Fordyce McRae. They had 65 exhibits over 28 years. So, ladies, I know... Uh, 21 in Truro celebrates their 21st anniversary next year, so you only have another seven years to go to equal that uh, and eight years to go to uh, overtake the record, so you go to it. However, meanwhile, back in uh, in Gloucester and back in uh, up here in uh, Kittery, Maine, uh, we have David and Connie who have been busy working towards a show and they're also working towards their October Skies workshop, a Sight and Insight workshop, which is October 10th through the 12th, uh, working on October Skies. I'm sure it's going to be a, a great uh, three-day workshop. But we're going to turn it over to, uh, to the uh, to two maestros, and they're going to be able to tell us more about these Sight and Insight programs, because it began... Just about a year ago, I think, Connie, right. um, when this first got started, uh, and what what was the impetus? Just remind us, because uh, maybe some of our listeners are, are new and don't uh, realise how you and David got started with the Sight and Insight program. Well, I think that that how it started is that um, it's sort of it's it's our backgrounds. So David has been teaching oil painting for, what, about 30 years or more. Mm -hmm. um, I have been um, concentrating. I have a, a doctorate in psychology and clinical psych, and, and um, I have been doing a lot of work in, in um, actually writing uh, at universities and, and um, private practice, and so what we decided to do was merge art and psychology. Yeah, I think that's and an that interesting is, combination. Yeah, and that is what uh, Sight and Insight is. Mm -hmm. Sight being, you know, the tools and, and um, techniques and implements for, mm -hmm. 
for studying and seeing yeah. what you what like you have in plain observational air. Observational skills, hand-eye yeah. coordination. <clears throat> hand-eye yeah. coordination. And then insight being the interior portion or subjectivity mm-hmm. that that the artist goes through, the psychological parts of uh, painting, and actually the feelings that we want to generate in our oil paintings. Mm-hmm. It is, and I think, you know, in, in the short time that you've been doing this, I think you've, you, you've made a good start to this. You had a Sight and Insight Composition Workshop earlier this year. I know you were working on wanting to put uh, together a a book or certainly more written material than there is at the Mm. moment. And so there are things that are sort of a a work in progress, but the workshops like, as I say, the upcoming October Skies, how, David, how would you teach that that would be different perhaps to just a regular workshop? Well, uh, we, we still approach it from the point of view of the site, or the, mm-hmm. uh, the uh, technique, or a way of doing something mm-hmm. on the canvas. Uh, but Connie's mm-hmm. adding this other dimension of the interior world of the artist, mm-hmm. which we feel is a major source of the inspiration uh, <clears throat> to create a painting. Also, we believe that those principles of creativity inspire and not only help the individual to achieve their own technique the way they want it to look. I think sometimes teaching is difficult because you show them how to do it Mm -hmm. and they have to do it the way you show them Mm -hmm. in order to get it right. Um, And I think painting, sometimes that can be stifling. And a lot of students, I think, might be discouraged after one instructor saying, "This this is the truth. I want you to paint the truth the way I see it. And I think our program, Connie's program and I, are much more about the individual finding their own way. Um, so from my point of view, I, step, I take a step back to, sh- to allow them to express themselves in the paint. They might come up with some new idea. A lot of this also is experimentation that Connie and I are doing with with different principles like one of the principles we we know there's a lot big stress nowadays in the uh, um, in the in the art world today of drawing first and then learning to paint after you learn to draw learn to draw first I don't necessarily think that's that has to be. As but a, wasn't that the way that they traditionally taught artists years ago? Well, in the, the 19th century it was, but prior to the 19th century there was program, the Louvre was a, and I think we talked about copying the masters, right. the Louvre was a place of learning, not a place to go and look at fine art and to waltz around with, uh, <laughs> with your tails on and... Um, oh. and, <laughs> uh, and, and admire... <laughs> and admire great paintings, it was a place to go and learn to paint. Yeah. So they copied to learn to paint, which I think makes a little more sense than learning to use a pencil or charcoal. Mm, I agree. And then go yeah. from charcoal and pencil to a loaded brush. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's like, it's like opposites. Oh, yeah. and, I, and I don't think this, you know, Connie talks about feelings a lot. I don't think the feeling of paint going on a surface and a pencil going on a, on a piece of paper has anything to do with each other, really. No. Right. And and when I speak of feelings, it's not coming from a psychological standpoint. It's actually Harold Speed, who's the classic um, writer on oil painting and, um, and actually a wonderful book on drawing, um, is, is emphasizing feelings constantly in his, in his books. Right. So, so it's that plus we have Cezanne who said the Louvre was a place where, you, where an artist goes to learn to read. Oh, very good. And uh, I thought that was a wonderful uh, quote from Cezanne, meaning that you have to learn a, a process by which you can actually uh, get into the the meat of the matter, let's say, or mm-hmm. the the content of something, and um, and you do that through imitating others' brushstrokes and and how they did the finish and and what kind of uh, way in which they go about um, 
structuring a composition. Mm. You know, and I think you learn that through imitation a lot of times. So so that's just one little aspect of, of what we're doing, what we're and, doing and, inside and we, and we really we really uh, uh, really promote the idea of learning through copying uh, greater painters than ourselves in order to learn more about the whole idea of paint and how they use paint. And Connie's made a practice of this very successfully, I might add, about copying great paintings. And I think recently we mentioned in Copying the Master, she went to the museum to copy a Claude Monet. And I can see it from here. And it, it really does say everything Monet would have said <laughs> about painting, which was key it up, make it bright, Make it, uh, the light is bright, and it's made up of multiple rainbow chips of color. And I think you really ca captured that. Um, and that brings up the, the point, we're sitting here um, in a, we have uh, almost 50 paintings hanging uh, in four rooms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's an absolute gorgeous show that we put together. Uh, it's Connie and I did one last year. And this year we invited our painting friend Tommy Heinsohn to join us. So it's the three of us together, uh, and we called the show Three with a Brush, which was interesting because my mother came, my 99 year old <laughs> mother, we were racking our brains for at least a couple hours trying to figure out a good name for, to, uh, for the show. And then my mother said, how about Three with a Brush? And we all said, yeah, that's a good title. It's a good one. <laughs> and just in case, uh, obviously by the time this uh, podcast goes out, the, the show will have uh, officially finished. It's a, it's a specifically a, a one-day show. Right. Um, but if anybody wants to see the work that is included in this, you can check it out on Instagram, uh, excuse me, Instagram, Curtis Harris Art. That's right. Um, or on one of the websites, davidpcurtis.com or lawwinpaintings.com. So if you check in on one of those sites, uh, you'll be able to see the kind of uh, paintings that were included in this exhibition. So I hope you'll uh, take the chance to see what uh, these uh, three with a brush artists have come up with. It's interesting to see you going out there and 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 painting for yourselves because I know teaching, you know, is a a concept that you have to sort of switch hats. And David, I know over the years, you found it hard to. I teach and paint at the same time for a class, so you generally don't even do a demonstration these days, which is what you used to do, but you you go around, you're primarily a teacher when you're doing a workshop. Yes, yeah, uh, we do have demonstrations and lectures and critiques, right. so that uh, we really, Connie and I both buy into the idea of critiquing is very important, and whether it's uh, whether I go person to person, uh, student to student, easel to easel for the critique, or the critique is at the end of the class uh, showing our work in front of everybody. But I think it's very important to, uh, to find the, um, the thing that is necessary to build your, your painting better. I think our program, this, you talked about our Sight and Insight program, and um, I think we, where we just started it, and the podcast is uh, part of this Sight and Insight program, we're hoping to develop more of these um, lesser-known concepts. Um, uh, memory painting, we, we want to incorporate more with the Sight and Insight program. We really believe that you'd become a better painter if you uh, used your memory more or trained your memory. For instance, I'm driving down the one, Route 128 in, near Boston, and there's a beautiful moonrise. You know, it's spectacular. I didn't know it was going to be this good. No one knows what's going to happen. And, it's, and I happen to be going past a big, a big uh, lake or a big pond or whatever it is, and there's the moon reflecting. But I, I'm in the traffic jam. I can't even pull over to take a picture of this. I don't have the time. But if I train my memory to remember that scene, to remember the colors, to remember the shapes, so that if I go home and while it's still fresh in my mind, I sit down with a little, maybe a little six by eight or a five by seven, make a little uh, impression of what I remembered, but keep on practicing that, that, that memorization, uh, my paintings from life will get better. Yeah. yeah. Right. And also, I would, uh, the other thing that I, I feel that David and I are emphasizing is design. 
that we're really uh, focusing on how you design your painting. Mm -hmm. That at first we, we were calling it composition. Composition's a fine term, but uh, we've, we've emphasized um, and, and uh, believe it's more specifically design. And it is how the... And, and you can create designs in your head. So, for instance, uh, taking what David was saying about seeing a beautiful scene, uh, you capture that and then you create that design in your head, which will, it will reinforce that memory. It's a memory aid, actually. Design becomes a memory aid. And um, I'm thinking, too, as I'm talking about this, the image I had a, a set of a bank of clouds as I was driving down to Gloucester uh, several several days ago, and and there was a big fog. It was actually before this, or right after the hurricane, um, uh, Florence, mm -hmm. and um, and I was looking at this bank of clouds and thinking, fabulous! This is a fabulous piece of work, you know, right at the at the horizon. And I can still see it to this day, and I'm sure it'll go into one of my paintings at some point. Mm -hmm. See, the, I think the trick is for you not to feel that you're constrained to match something that is happening in the present moment at the time. You can mix and match things according to what your memory recalls of a certain scene yeah or perhaps the feeling that it uh, yes yeah. and the and the feeling nature yeah. of it you see and i think that excuse me i mean uh pardon me but feeling is an important part of that because that's what i was in, in in connie's case the clouds or in my case the moonrise um that it was the feeling of that it created that inspired me to want to do it um but the training of the memory is everything because when you think about it when you're painting from life, I can't stare at the object I want to paint without l taking my eyes off it to look at the mm -hmm. canvas in which I'm putting the brush strokes on. So if I can memorize what I see, I can spend more time designing, thinking about the brush strokes, the colors, the relationship of my painting, uh, because I have a good impression of what I've seen. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the other thing that I was thinking about um, when I first met David, it was in 2004, and um, I went to his Saturday classes, and, and I recall that people were saying, uh, one person said something to me like, well, he goes to the Greenbelt every time, and, you know, I'm, I'm tired of painting at the Greenbelt. But I find that restrict, that saying, well, okay, we're going to paint marshes at the Greenbelt, that it allowed me to get creative. And, and um, I still think, and I emphasize the fact that I don't think you need to travel to distant lands to get inspired or to um, get creative. Um, a lot of times people think, well, if I go overseas and, and paint in France, you know, that that's going to be a really cool and, and all this. But it, inspiration is all around us. And I think that the Sight and Insight programs will increase your awareness of this process. So another, another thing we teach besides memory painting and copying the master, so those are two principles. And design, design and, and uh, color. We have a wonderful theory on design, which uh, Connie calls the line of design. Mm -hmm. And you start with a sort of a arabesque, if you will, or a general line that uh, creates the whole rhythm of the canvas. And then from there, uh, Connie believes, and I think this works for everybody, color spotting within the painting. Um, and then to the point where, because I think as you're painting, you're always pushing your design. I think you're always moving into the design and changing it or adjusting it according to whether it's color, whether it's the subject matter, or whether it's the um, placement of the objects you're trying to capture. Mm -hmm. So I think there's that. Also, too, some of the new ideas we're, we're bringing in is one is um, uh, curvy linear perspective, which we're going to eventually <coughs> introduce as well. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Which is a very, um, it's not as complicated as you think because the, our eyes see curvy, curvy linear to begin with. Uh, we don't see flat. Perspective is not one of those um, things that is based off of uh, lines going off like a set of railroad tracks. Because it's, our eyeballs are flat, they're curvy. Yeah, and I'm talking about visual perspective and not uh, linear perspective in the, in the case of... Uh, of using the the actual lines going to the horizon line, uh, from ground mm -hmm. plane to the horizon line. As a painter, I I think we, it's helpful to know that just like it's helpful to know human anatomy if you were, we were painting figures. Yeah. And I think that's important. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the essence of what we're trying to approach with sight and insight, is this idea that the creative process. And I think we've had some podcasts on imagination, on beauty, on aesthetics. Those are things that you will find a source of material within yourself to it's either inspire you or to help you to finish a great painting. And I know a lot of painters, friends of mine, don't want to talk about imagination or maybe they're afraid of what they're imagining, huh? <laughs> um, or, but I... Uh, or, or beauty. They don't want to discuss beauty, you know. Oh, yeah, I don't want to talk about beauty, you know. It, it's kind of a shame because I think these are, these are uh, uh, necessary and aesthetics, tools. And, aesthetics, yeah. you know. Um, I think, I, I agree. I think that they're very necessary and, and allow us to, we get stuck in habitual patterns. And we can easily get stuck in a habitual pattern of going out, painting on site, um, and using a certain way, you know, certain palette, um, a set of colors. And, and um, the Sight and Insight program is about busting us out of those habitual patterns, mm -hmm. out of that autopilot, you know, mm -hmm. and into something that allows us to get creative right. and to stay creative. You know, one of the things is to even... Um, uh, recognize the movement in your painting hand, you know, mm -hmm. and to allow that to to uh, become somewhat of a dance for you, rather than becoming a um, a tight uh, way of of putting your brush strokes down. We want to free people up. Mm -hmm. Right, and and I mean the uh, the the Chinese uh, and a lot of the Eastern artists spent their whole lives with the understanding that with the right manipulation of a brush stroke, how much you could create. And right. uh, if you think of mm -hmm. the Chinese screen painters uh, who did these beautiful peonies, the, the flowers always felt like the flowers. And yeah. I think it was because they were really trying to master the idea of doing it like a flower. Yeah. It's right. momentary. It, it blooms, and if it's too hot, those petals, uh, especially on a peony, will just melt away, you know, in the heat. Right. And so it's it's so fleeting, you know, yeah. that beauty. Yeah. Now, I remember trying to do Chinese brush painting years ago. Um, and just, as you say, manipulating the brush. Obviously, I have no hand-eye coordination to start with. But um, we had a friend who, who could do it very well. And mm -hmm. we, you could watch, and it looked so simple. And yet the minute I tried, I had the brush in my hand and was trying to make those strokes, it just went to pot. So if I might just come back to, you were talking about the memory, um, uh, how the use of memory in, in painting. Um, what would you recommend for people like me whose memories are totally shot and can't remember anything? I know you developed a memory card um, at the beginning uh, of this well, yeah, we program, still, we still use but, it. Uh, you know, where you um, did you find it's it worked for what you wanted? Did you feel the need to tweak it as you go along? So, well, it's interesting. All point. these things, like um, I mean, we, we were talking about. I think the golden ratio at some point. It's wonderful to bring science into art or have science and art merge. But the number of painters who once they understand what the golden ratio is, they're looking for something new just like the scientist is looking for using his imagination to say, but what else is out there, you know, besides the golden ratio, besides fractals? Uh, you know, science and mathematics is trying to prove these scientific things. And I, th I think what's wonderful about what we're trying to do is that when we handed out the memory card to the students, 
how many variable memory cards I was getting back. I mean, we expected them all to come back like a like a test in a school, you know, and A, B, C, D. You, you got number one wrong, so therefore you only got a 90, you know. Um, in this case, everybody used it differently. Mm -hmm. And most, a lot of people said, where can I get more of these cards? They right. really thought it was valuable to them, but they applied it, everybody used it differently. And I thought that says everything about what, what artists do. Yeah, you know? I mean, it's all about if in individuality, you, you need to apply certain basic principles of art to what you're doing, but right. it's also just seen through the eyes of an individual artist, right. and that's where I would imagine psychology comes in, is that, you know, three people painting the same scene might do it differently because um, their, their whole psychology of sight is different. Mm -hmm. This is what I think, looking at this exhibition, I know that... Uh, you know, you guys and, and Tommy all painted down uh, near the Sarah Long Bridge and you all have different interpretations of it. Um, so it's it's interesting to see similarities um, in in the, you know, light and the, and the design, but they're all so individual, obviously. Right. That's the, the beauty of painting. I and, think... And, oh, go ahead. No, oh, sure. Well, I was just going to say that the imagination is the space between the creator and that object that you're referring to, you know? Yeah. And, um, and that it's, a, it's that almost, <laughs> it's a veil, you yeah. know? And I think, uh, I think it's sort of a thin veil between what happen, what the creator is thinking and then what that, what that object of contemplation is out there. And so, so in that process... I think we're seeing a variety of different imaginative renderings of, of something, of an object. And um, I, I think that that is, is part two. That also is what, what Sight and Insight is going to be involved mm -hmm. in. It's um, because David mentioned the creative process, and the creative process has principles, one being imagination, one aesthetics, beauty, all these things are uh, parsimony. He keeps referring to parsimony. <laughs> <laughs> Loves that one. Yeah, yeah, well, you well, know? The other way, I, I, rather than saying parsimony, I might say uh, less is more. Yes, Which and, is the, and uh, also it's, um, I brought up Occam's razor. Yep. You know, which is which is means that the simplest explanation is probably the best explanation for something, and um, and when we do that in painting, we usually get the be the biggest bang for our buck. I'd say. Well, you know, and and you know? I do. And this is one of the reasons why Sight and Insight merged is because of your psychology background. Yeah. I was uh, as an art student, I was really fascinated with psychology, uh, especially Carl Jung. And I was a product of the late 60s and the 70s, where Jung was very popular amongst the, the young people I knew. Um, and it might have taken me four or five times to read one of his books to understand it. <laughs> and, but I, I did it, and I really enjoyed it. And I think psychology is a great way of understanding what painting is. I mean, when I think of the history... 500, 600 years old of easel paintings, you know, and those Renaissance masters. And, and we haven't changed it that much to the here we are five, yeah. 600 years later. And we're I still agree. sort of very similar to do that. Mm -hmm. I can't think of anything, especially in our age where, you know, all of a sudden there's not a phone booth or a TV aerial anywhere, thank mm -hmm. goodness. But um, that, that things are moving so rapidly nowadays. But art... It, it's, it's it's still the, it's still it's timeless. It's timeless yeah. and it's yeah. so fascinating yeah. to many many people many people and I know a lot of people. Want, uh, my son would have been a great painter, and he said to me, Dad, "Dad, I'm a perfectionist. It will never work for me because it can <laughs> never be perfect." And I think that is that can be frustrating for some, but it's that puzzling, uh, figuring something out. That I think uh, you, Connie, uh, found yeah. a lot of interest in art yeah. uh, with an un with a psychological background. Yeah, it's true. Um, I was thinking about um, that. True knowledge as an artist happens through sensory intelligence. Mm -hmm. 
as opposed to through book learning and, um, you know, um, certain artist statements. I mean, we can all read an artist statement and things like that, but none of that is how the artist actually performed and 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 came up with with the result of a, a beautiful painting right after 25 years of teaching the the method I did and I stuck with one principle which harkened back all the way back to not only my teacher Ives Gamble but my father mm. uh, in having discussions around the dinner table and the word value was was everything so at the age of 10 I think I understood what a value <laughs> meant you know, yeah. uh, so and and that's very helpful, and I think we do want to stick with the principles mm -hmm. um, of painting. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think it's very important to understand the principles. So we don't we don't uh, change the principles of a good painting, mm -hmm. but we do give you new approaches of learning to use those principles. That's, yeah. Yes, yes, and and gateways to access those in yourself mm -hmm. because we believe that everybody has it. In themselves, they're, they're not lacking. It's just that it must be remembered or mm. or brought to awareness. Yeah. Well, thank you both of you. Another fascinating half hour's conversation, and uh, I just want to uh, leave with with one thought here because I believe I did hear a rumor of a, maybe a sight and insight figure class this winter. I don't have the full details. But I just want to leave you with, uh, with this thought. And uh, obviously, as soon as we have information about the class, we'll, uh, we'll post it. In the meantime, here we have a quote from Eugene Delacroix, who says, If you are not skillful enough to sketch a man jumping out of a window in the time it takes him <laughs> to fall from the fourth story to the ground, you will never be able to produce great works. So with that, uh, with that great thought in mind, uh, I'll say thank you for listening and I hope you'll join us next week for another edition of the Sights and Insight podcast. Thanks for listening and goodbye for now. Mm -hmm.